Sydney, welcome to coming on to the show. We today we have Sydney Montgomery. Um, you have your own admissions consulting firm, right? That provides law school admissions consulting and college counseling services. So you, you're yeah. not just law school, okay? And um, you're a graduate of Princeton and Harvard Law School. You're a professional member of the Independent Educa Educational Consultants Association. And I guess you sit on the Graduate Committee and the Ethics Committee. That caught yeah. my eye for some reason. I don't know why. Ethics are important. <laughs> yes, ethics are important. Sure. I was just curious what kind of ethics um, you deal with, but we can talk about that later, if at wow. all. Um, the board, uh, you're also on the board for, of the Institute for anti racist education and the co-founder of college equity first okay didn't make her bio but she's also a member of the bay area tutoring summit which is a group that uh, i helped start 10 years ago um in the san francisco bay area and has now grown grown into this huge group of uh independent tutors and um consultants of a whole bunch of different stripes that's how i actually uh met sydney in the first place yeah we've awesome. expanded to the east coast <laughs> yeah well zoom now so um i guess the bay area tutoring summit is everywhere but uh anyway shout out to those guys welcome yeah, so on sydney, the show you're thank in you thank you i'm happy to be here maryland you must i am in maryland moved, you moved from the bay area <laughs> i'm a i'm a lifelong marylander actually i have deep pride for my state oh okay so Wow. I don't understand how you guys met initially. I actually, um, I connected with another Bay Area Tutoring Summit member through the uh, University of California Irvine Certificate Program in Independent Educational Consulting. And uh, Megan DeVries, she's fantastic at tutoring. Shout out to her. And um, she really thought that it would be a great connection uh, between BATS and I, and I really enjoyed getting to know the members and getting to know a lot of their diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and inclusion and belonging efforts. And so I'm really excited to have been connected with that group. Yeah, great. Nathan, um, you brought Sydney on here. What is... I want to get right into the ethics stuff. I want to know all the stuff that we're doing wrong. Yeah, so <laughs> um, so I'm a member of a couple of organizations, right? So IECA, the Independent Educational Consultants Association, as well as NACAC, the National Association for College Admission Counseling. And both organizations have a principles of good practice. And so there are there are certain things, there's, you know, a few different sections that we as consultants like to hold ourselves to that kind of distinguish us from the Rick Singer varsity blues type consultants backdoor dealing with admissions. And so, you know, of course, one of the things is that we are not agents of schools. We don't take money from schools. We're independent in that regard. We also actually don't um, allow kind of this kickback between even like tutoring services. So, you know, if I am referring Wait, Jack Smith Sydney, to- Sorry, yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt you for half a second. Did you say that admissions consultants take money from schools? No, <laughs> I did not. Well, Rick Singer did. Uh, and then, some, then, then, they, went to, and then they went to jail. That's what she's saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So, uh, you made it sound like, like a general practice. Like, oh, we don't do that. You know, there's this whole group of no, people. Well, I'm sure there's I think, plenty that do. I think yeah. there are people that do, right? And I think that- Yeah, but who um, do you talk to at the school to <laughs> set that up? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't know. Okay, sure. Okay, good. <laughs> but um, we actually, uh, IUCA enjoys a really great relationship with uh, schools and organizations. So because of our ethics, standards that we're, you know, we're not doing any kind of weird dealing. We're only working in our area of competency. That's another great thing. So if a student comes to me and she's like, I want to go to college for equestrian, listen, I don't, I don't know anything about horses. I am going to refer her out to a colleague. Uh, someone comes to me and they want med school consulting, also going to refer out to someone else. I only work within my zone. Um, but it's really great because we have these ethics that um, we're able to go to conferences and have these meetings with admission deans and admission directors and um, really learn from the other side of the desk uh, because they know that we're gonna be ethical with the information. And if they tell us, hey, this is not for you to share with families and students, we don't share that with families and students, but it helps us in our advising. The way that the ethics committee really functions is we also don't make 
um, claims that incite fear mongering or anxiety or also just they're not true. So I'm not going to say I guarantee to get you into Harvard Law School. I don't make guarantees about schools. I absolutely don't. Right. That's a huge ethics thing. Um, and I don't say, hey, you better work with me or you're never going to become a lawyer because uh, there are consultants, you know, everyone can hang up a shingle right now. It's an unlicensed profession, although there is moves to have people take, you know, become a certified educational planner and have that licensing. And I know there is some legislation that actually has been circulating in California about that, probably after the Rick Singer Varsity Blues incident. But, um, you know, I have to be uh, fair in my advertising and fair in what I can say. I can help you. Um, I can make it a smoother process for you, but I cannot guarantee you to get into any schools. And so when there are complaints, though, um, either if people say, hey, this consultant has some unethical messaging or if a parent feels like they were taken advantage of by a consultant, that's when the ethics committee comes in and we kind of, I won't say we arbitrate, but we just um, give space to kind of figure out what happened and also to maybe give space to figure out like how that consultant can be more ethical in their practice. It's a volunteer organization. So, um, you know, membership is not guaranteed and it's not a right. Uh, but we are, I think there's over 2,500 educational consultants in IECA and NACAC, the National Association for College Admission Counselors has over 23,000 members because their members also include college admissions uh, professionals on that side of the desk, as well as school-based counselors. Um, and so there's a lot of um, collegiality that happens there, but we also understand that we want to do what's right for students and we want to just help make the process smoother and make the profession um, more widely understood and um, respected. Um, <clears throat> that a, a lot of that made sense to me. A lot of it sounded like just also good business practices, right? But one thing that st stuck out was you said that sometimes the schools will tell you information that they don't want you to convey to parents or students. Um, and you, you said, oh, we respect that and that maintains our ethics. But there's part of my brain that's saying, wait, it, is that ethical? I mean, part of your responsibility is to your students and to say, look, you're applying to the school. You shouldn't be applying to the school because of X, Y, Z or whatnot. So I, I'm just curious what kind of information yeah. <laughs> they're hiding. I so mean, I that itself is questionable, it, right? I like, wouldn't call like, it don't hiding. Don't tell parents this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wouldn't call it hiding. I think that sometimes, you know, especially when we are having maybe meetings with uh, lower level admissions officers, for example, they may say something that maybe not as polished as they would say it to a family, right? Um, so it's not that they're hiding anything. It's not that the information is, or, you know, not misleading. If there was something truly important, um, obviously we would, it would be a different conversation. But, you know, sometimes I might say, hey, you know, I can't even give you an example, but it might just be a tongue in cheek comment, or it might be like, you know, we're really worried about this this year. Um, and the way that I might convey that to a parent might be different from how it's said. Um, mm. But I would always give information to my parents and families that I thought would be pertinent to either making their decision or where they're applying. I mean, for example, things like financial health of an institution, I'm always going to tell parents about. Um, likewise for law school students, right? If that was something that was shared as a concern, it doesn't really come up often where, you know, schools might say, hey, this is information that we're sharing with counselors and this is information that we're sharing with parents. I think the reason why they have sometimes that information uh, bifurcated like that is because we as counselors understand the context of the admissions landscape, you know, both law school and college. We understand the bigger picture and sometimes because parents and families don't fully understand the picture, they would want that information disseminated through the counselors in a way that the parents and families can best make use of that information. Okay. And if you don't have a counselor. Right. So um, I think there's a lot of inequities in, in general, as you know, my goal is to help make admissions in general more equitable. The reality of the fact is that I think there was a survey that said most high school seniors spend probably 36 minutes with their public school counselor. And so a lot of these uh, webinars and stuff are available to school counselors, almost all of them. There aren't things that independent consultants get that school counselors don't have access to um, or that pre-law advisors don't have access to at colleges. Uh, but uh, of course they have a larger caseload and they have a larger, um, they have more things on their plate. And sometimes, you know, 
that means that they are not able to go to as many of these things. So I think some of the value of having a consultant is that you do get a little bit more personalized attention um, if you go to a large public school. For me, I want to be part of changing the profession and the um, I think just the thought that independent educational consultants only serve the wealthy, I really push back on that. Most of my clients are first gen or minority, either first gen to college or first gen to law school. And I think a lot of times we just need to be more flexible in how we're charging or what our pricing payment structure is or the delivery model. Um, because for me, I mean, my parents both work two jobs and I financially support um, my sister's educational expenses and my own medical expenses. And so I get it. Like I was the kid that had three jobs in college and three jobs in law school um, and two jobs most of my adult life. And so for me, I don't want to be completely inaccessible. That's why it's so important to me to give away as much free content as I do and to have, you know, places where students can access information, even if they don't have a lot of funds. Um, and so I think that there are ways that as a profession, I'm just going to say it, we as independent consultants can do better to reach and serve the middle class, uh, the lower income families, and not just in an, oh, I do pro bono and I have five students kind of way, but in a meaningful way that actually increases access. Probably a good spot for you to shout out your various uh, channels. You're talking about giving away free content. Where can people find that? Yeah, so people can find my content. I have a YouTube channel, S. Montgomery Admissions Consulting. I post a new law school video every Monday. And then I have a free Facebook group called Barrier Breakers Law School Edition. It's a free Facebook group uh, primarily targeted to minority and first-gen applicants where I go live every week and answer all of your questions totally for free. Um, I also give free information. I answer uh, questions in like comments and posts. I also am on Instagram at S Montgomery Consulting. You can always find free tips there. And I actually just released a free 60 page guide. It's an essential guide to applying to law school. I put together all of my application guides and really worked to make it uh, quality content for you. Um, that should take you through at least a bare foundation of the important um, components of your law school admissions process. I do run a free webinar. Uh, how to gain control and really maximize your law school application process. And that free webinar goes through how you can focus on timing, how you can focus on your written applications, and you can focus on your letters of recommendation in order to control the parts of your application that you can control. Uh, because access and information dissemination is really important to me. When we talk about the education gap in this country, we're usually just talking about teachers and students, but we're not talking about resources and information and um, family and support gaps. So that's the part that I really want to shore up. Yeah, there's a big gap there. I mean, <clears throat> I, I definitely did not spend 36 minutes with my high school counselor. Uh, I spent about four minutes with my high school counselor and she gave me nothing but bad advice. So um, I'm a first generation college student and I definitely feel that lack of, you know, any kind of help really um, for yeah, people that are situated like that. It's really hard. And I think it can also be a really isolating experience. So uh, last year I launched my law school boot camps, my application boot camps, And so uh, what I love about it is that it, allows you to go through the entire law school application process with a cohort of two to four students. And I have found that they have actually done better in the application process in some ways, uh, better even than my private one-on-one -on -one students because they're accountability partners to each other because life happens, especially with COVID and you're dealing with maybe job loss or you're dealing with death or you're just dealing with setbacks. And to have a place where you can kind of call your home and a people to call your home has been really exciting. So I'm really glad that I was able to create that space. And then I also created a space to connect my high school students to my law school students and an alumni platform because that's great for, for me, it's just important that people can see the future and see their next step. I think you're going to love uh, coming to our black students uh, study group today at LSAT yeah. Demon. I'm really happy that you can stop by. I've, I've seen that happening already in the various communities we've set up for people to meet each other. It's just clear that if they have a couple buddies in the group, 
they can share resources and commiserate and just kind of keep each other. The whole group is lifting up because, because of, you know, somebody asks for help or some, you know, just, the, they're just so good and so helpful to each other. It's amazing what you can absolutely achieve in those small groups. Absolutely. Cool. So um, maybe we should transition into um, you have a, a, a tip here about law school personal statements that I would like you to expand upon a little bit. You, you wrote that your personal statement does not need to be an exercise in trauma Olympics, which I thought yeah. was a very uh, <laughs> pithy way of putting it. You want to talk about that a little bit? I do. I do. So, so many students um, come to me and I think they've gotten the advice that their personal statement needs to just be an adversity statement. Here's what I've overcome in my life. And therefore, here's why I'm a great law school student. And for me, when I help my students write essays, it's a couple of things. One, I want to know why you want to go to law school and why it's the next logical step on your career path. And if at the end of reading your essay or even your application materials as a whole, I'm still not actually convinced that you know what you want to do in the law beyond this amorphous, give voice to those that don't have a voice, help my community defend the marginalized, um, then I am not as convinced. And so one of the things that I say is when you really only focus on adversity, um, not only are you at risk of centering someone else's story, a lot of times you'll tell me about your mom or your dad or your grandma who's really gone through it, but you risk reducing yourself to a single story narrative. So the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, actually, she's the author of Americana, um, We Should All Be Feminists, Half a Yellow Sun. She talks about the dangers in her TED Talk of reducing herself to a single story narrative. So I tell my students, you are more than just trauma. You are more than just pain. Admissions committees also want to know about your strengths and your accomplishments and how you've already been working in this field. If you're passionate about food law, maybe you've already been working at a food bank or you've done some policy work around food deserts. Those are the things that I really want to hear about. And so I tell my students that when you're brainstorming, you should make a list actually. And, you know, I have an organizer of all of the significant moments of your life, both good and bad, personal and professional impacts, accomplishments, adversities, maybe things that relate to the law, and then kind of craft your essay using multiple stories, usually about two, maybe one personal and one professional, but it doesn't have to be that. And really show and paint the picture for me of how you are really moved and driven to pursue law school in that way. I think when you, you can mention adversity, it can be part of your story, but I don't think it needs to be the main character, right? It could be like uh, the side character or maybe it makes a cameo appearance. You have a diversity statement in which you can talk about how a unique experience or identity that you have or a multiplicity of identities um, and intersect intersectionality really works to shape your perspective on the world and will shape how you interact in the law school classroom. And I think that is a really important thing that students sometimes confuse with their personal statement. But I like to see you go beyond your adversity because um, you're more than that. And I think students just really feel like they have to tell the biggest sob story um, so they can show that they've overcome all these things and they've become so resilient. And that's why they're going to be a great lawyer. But I think I think there's more to that. Do they do that because they get bad advice telling them that that's what they should do? I have seen, um, I have seen bad advice on the circling on the internet. Uh, basically, a whole little arc about like start with your obstacle, then how you overcame your obstacle, and then what you learned. And I cringe every time I see that advice on the internet because I'm like, but what about law school and the law? No, okay. Um, I just think that we missed an opportunity there. Well, I would say a lot of like tragedies or adversities that people write about end up making them seem naive too, right? So something that's a challenge to one person can come across as very mm -hmm. petty um, to an admissions officer. And so you feel like you've shown this great like insight or learning experience in your life where in reality, it's kind of like, wait, maybe you should have known that before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I have there's Sorry, go ahead, Sydney. I was going to say, I have seen that. Um, and I always tell students, right, like your feelings are valid. I'm not disrespecting your experiences. Uh, but as a Black woman, when I read sometimes some of uh, the well-meaning examples of how they've experienced racism in their life, I'm like, 
this is not the example that you want. Um, th- th- like it's bad and microaggressions are, are forms of racism, right? They're not nothing to be swept under the rug and they do contribute to and eventually lead to over and racist and even deadly racism. However, censoring your personal statement on a microaggression is perhaps not the best thing that you could do right now. It's just bad advocacy. I mean, it's you're you're supposed you're you're applying to be you're auditioning to be a lawyer, right? This is mm-hmm. your first legal brief. This is your first bit of advocacy where you're advocating for yourself to get into law school and you just come with like a plea for sympathy or some yeah. I mean, even if it wasn't a microaggression, it could be a macroaggression. But I don't care nearly as much about the macroaggression as I care about, and I don't care how you feel afterward. I care what you did afterward. And that's the big difference, right? Like you, you say, I think we're saying the same thing. You say, where's the connection to law school? Can you tie this in? And what you mean is like, well, what did you do Yeah. after? <laughs> Are you doing something about it? Because what we see, it's probably... I don't know, Ben, would you agree? It's the most common mistake we see in law school personal statements is to just focus on this big trauma. It's an exercise in trauma Olympics. And then it's like telling all the, you know, this is how I feel. And I now have a passion and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But there's nothing that you've actually done. Yeah, I would have rather seen two really great examples of things that you did in your personal life and things that you did in your professional life, maybe three, two examples of things that you did in your professional life, and then what you're going to do with your law school. And I always say, like, also tell them what you're going to do at the school. Is there a clinic you're going to join? Is there uh, a center that you're going to be a part of? But don't just list it, right? Like, I want you to research and figure out what is it that they do? Do they write briefs? Do they advocate for clients? Are they, you know, making arguments? Like, I I need to know what you plan to do, because I also need to know that you don't have a fictitious idea of what it means to be a lawyer. Right. I was a family law litigator for a little bit. Um, you know, I, I did practice and I will say even myself, when I made this decision, I decided a long time ago, I was going to be a lawyer. I didn't even have a realistic idea fully of what it meant to be a child advocate or uh, to be a family lawyer. But, you know, so often when I hear those phrases of just like, I'm going to, you know, be a voice for the voiceless. I'm like, how? (laughs) Like education, healthcare. Like, I just, I want to know how, you know? And if you can't tell me how, it's like, you're supposed to be persuading me. You're a lawyer. If I'm not persuaded that you know what you're getting into, then I'm not convinced you're going to stay after 1L. And now I'm convinced about my retention rate. And, you know, now I'm looking at your application kind of sideways. Yeah. Actual lawyer, Sydney Montgomery, doesn't care so much about your conclusions. She cares about the facts that support those conclusions. And if you're not bringing any facts, then the lawyer reading the document is like, what is this? It's worthless. There's no, (laughs) there's no evidence here. You just toss it immediately. No. Yeah. I need, I need receipts. And I honestly (laughs) think that a lot of what people put in their personal statement, when I see it really could just be pushed right into a diversity statement. Um, no. It sounds yeah. a lot like all the advice we've been giving over the years, Ben. Yeah, just a quick comment about all of this. Uh, I went to your website, by the way, and then I I got the notification prompting me to download your 62-page law school admissions <laughs> outline, which I did, or not outline, guide. And then I just scrolled down and right away, you jump right into this writing your essay and outlining. So if anyone (laughs) wants to dig into this a little bit further, go to S Montgomery Consulting. I don't know if you have anything else to say about that, but it looks pretty thorough. I am a really big fan of outlining. I was an English major at Princeton. And um, listen, we don't teach people how to write anymore. Um, But don't just write, like like actually have a plan, outline it. If the outline doesn't make sense, then the essay is not going to make sense. And Oftentimes I make people reverse engineer and go back to making an outline if their essay just seems all over the place. So not a terrible tip. I'm not an outliner myself and I bet Ben's not an outliner either, but we also scratch our heads. I mean, the, the personal statements that we see are so, so bad, That that is a basic tip that probably could be implemented in lots of cases. 
Well, I break it down in that guide. I, I break down how to outline. Um, so in a, in a lot of steps, um, but I also break down your supplemental essays, uh, your letters of rec, um, your diversity statement. We talk a lot about it there, your resume, your addenda, um, both for character and fitness and academic. So yeah, there's a lot of information to dig into in the guide. Cool. That's excellent. Um, what, what other advice do you have for minority applicants, yeah. first-generation college applicants? What yeah, is so the most I common question? And yeah. I often tell students also that it's really important, and I guess this could go for both college and law school, to know the communities that you'll be surrounding yourself with. Um, so that looks like reaching out to the Black Law Students Association or um, Lambda if you're LGBTQ, um, up, you know, the Asian American Pacific Islander Association, Southeast Asian Students Association. I think so many times students feel like they could only ask admissions to put them in contact with people. And like a lot of times these organizations have websites and they have like dedicated like membership or external vice presidents or people to contact. So I would say take the initiative and make those contacts. I spoke to a Black student at every single school that I applied to, to like really get the skinny. I didn't want to hear just like, oh, we all love each other. Like I wanted to like know what the community was going to be like, because especially at some schools, I mean, at some schools, there's like 18 Black students per class. And at some schools, there's 55 Black students per class. Not to say you could have a great experience at either, but um, you want to know who those people are and what that type is. I went to one school and um, there are only 12 Black students per class. And I hated like more than half of them when I got there. And I was like, okay, well, cool. These are the people I would be going to school with. And this is probably not the place for me. And it was like very informative. Um, I would also take the opportunity to reach out to any alumni if that's possible, either from your own college um, or high school at the colleges that you're looking at. I think that is really pertinent. And then making meaningful relationships with admissions can certainly go a long way, especially for borderline candidates or non-traditional candidates. I know a lot of part-time programs, they have... Um, availability to kind of talk to students and get to know them. I think when we also talk about this gray zone that we're in right now with waitlist negotiation, if you have been having a conversation with admissions since October, you're probably in a slightly better position than if you're just like, oh, hey, my name's Bill and I, I applied and now I'm going to start making contact with you. They're like, we don't know who you are, Bill. Um, so, you know, just really thinking about the whole process as relational and not transactional, I think can go a long way. Can you elaborate that a little bit more? So I, my concern is that students will hear that and they say, okay, I got to form a former relationship with the admissions committee or someone on the admissions team or, you know, in that, that department. And it's going to come across as tra transactional, right? Like mm -hmm. they're there. It's going to seem fake and not relational and not sincere. What, what character does the, do those conversations take and, and how do they get started? Yeah, so a lot of times it starts with going to an information session. I don't know why so many people don't go to information sessions, but you know, they should. And sometimes the information sessions are actually not super well attended. Um, and so there is, depending on the school, they might be on Zoom with webinar or, or whatever, and, you know, back when it was in person. But I like to have my students maybe follow up with the question if they have a genuine question after the information session. Um, we're really connecting to something that they said LSAC has those digital forums now that are online. And those are another great opportunity to actually get to know who the person is and like also ask questions. So I think sometimes we just uh, only focus on the person as being a symbol of the school and like not a person. And so I would love to know maybe what made them choose that school if they're an alum or what's their best thing about working there or how is their day going? today. I don't know, something simple, even at the forums, right? They're talking to a lot of people, they might be tired. Um, and then actually listening to the response and not just saying, cool, I asked them a question about themselves, checking it off the box. Um, I think that there are a lot of, not every admission professional is, is open to or has the time, but I have seen a lot of admission professionals really get to know a lot of my students in a way that is, is genuine and they're checking up. I know that I, um, one of my mentors, 
is an admissions uh, director at a school. And we, we just connected during the application process. Um, and he was so lovely. And I went and toured and, and he showed me around and, and he was like, you're probably not coming here. And I was like, what, what do you mean? He was like, no, you're probably going somewhere else, but these are the things that you should be looking at. And we just stayed in contact. I let him know where I went to school. I, you know, shot him an update email when I was in, you know, 1L, like maybe after like Christmas break or whatever. Um, and we're still friends, right? And that's what I mean about relational. Obviously the application process itself is shorter, but I wasn't looking at it as I'm only talking to this man so I can get into the school, but it's, hey, this is a person in the legal world, which uh, you know, could be beneficial or could just help me, or maybe I could help him. And it's just good to have these people around in your life. You never know. And, and by the way, that legal rule, world is extraordinarily small. I mean, super small. <laughs> super small. <laughs> you think of it right now as an applicant, and it's this big unknown black box that's huge and has tons of attorneys in it. But the reality is, uh, it's a very, very small world, and most people know each other. And having those sort of connections can be mm-hmm. immensely valuable, not only getting into the school that uh, may have the officer, uh, you know, um, that you're talking to, but I mean, that's amazing that you have this connection now. I, I can't imagine that won't be beneficial down the road. Yeah, I love meeting new people just for the joy of meeting new people. And I think if students approach how they go about connecting with admissions like that, like this is a whole person um, and they are a fantastic human that I could get to con- get to know. And, you know, maybe it'll also be beneficial to me. Maybe I will be beneficial to them. I think that the conversations will be more genuine. And sometimes the little gems that you hear, like when you, one of your questions you said was, you know, what, what brought you to this school? Um, I, I can see their answer being concocted in some way to right sell the school. But at the same time, um, if you can get that conversation started, then you can learn random things about a school that may attract you mm-hmm. to it or deter you or just the application process in general. I mean, the bottom line is that these people have information, lots of information that you don't have. So the more conversations that you have, the more opportunities you have to get exposed to information that may just be gloss again, but also could be helpful and make you a better applicant. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Awesome. Um, Ben, you ready to wrap it up there? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Sydney. If people want to find you again, what's the best way? Yeah, the best way. Thank you also so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this conversation. The best way for students to contact me is to, they can email me info at smontgomeryconsulting.com or they can go on my website, www.s, S as in Sam, uh, smontgomeryconsulting.com. And there you'll be able to find all the different ways that you can work with me or you can find all of the ways that you can get uh, content for free. And so I'd love to have uh, you in my orbit. I'd love to connect you with other students uh, that are going through the process just like you. That's excellent. Yeah, super happy to have you on, Sydney. Uh, I'll see you in about an hour for our Zoom group. Cool. I'll see you in an hour. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.